This is really a history-making kind of thing. Yeah, I think you get, give a round of applause before we tell you who's here, all right? We have Alan Russo. We have Julie, and we're, we're the Shepherd Clan here. We have Julie and Laura right over here, okay? We have Rosemary Russo right over here next to Rick Armstrong. We have Jeff Lovell. We have Susan Lovell. We have Jay Lovell. We have Barbara. And then in the, it, those are all Lovells. The Lovells obviously have packed the court tonight, all right? So, and then we have the Aldrins over there. We, we have, we have, right at the other end there. Right. It's Andy and Jan. Jan's the one on the left, just so you know. Okay, that's. So if there's any favorite daughter question, it's uh, it may be tough for, for, for others here. So this is uh, it's a lot of fun. And I don't know about you, anytime you talk to family members, and you know, it's like families of test pilots and so forth, and you'd say, well, what was it like? Because you know, everybody expects that it was, it was like what you saw in Life magazine, or it's like what you saw on television, or that, you know, that, <laughs> Dad would come home from work and Walter Cronkite would announce him into the living room, you know, that kind of stuff. And that they all had Corvettes, you know, those, those kinds of things that we all kind of thought. But a lot of it was just kind of like, it's every day. I mean, it's easy on the outside to assume what it was like, and that's why we thought it'd be fun today to let you hear and let them maybe say for the first time in the company of, of witnesses uh, what, what really went on. I want to start with, with the Shepherd girls, Julie and, and, and Laura here. You know, thinking back to the first, I mean, after all of that space history, and all of a sudden here's dad going up in the Redstone rocket, and it's, you know, you're, you're, you're first into the, uh, the fishbowl in many respects at that point. So what was it like growing up in the neighborhood where you know, everybody seemed to work for NASA, everybody was busy doing heroic things? Well, the world turned. The favorite daughter can jump in, whichever one you um. to be. <laughs> The favorite daughter jumped in. We didn't live down in Clear Lake where all the astronauts lived. When mother went to Houston to uh, find a house or a place to live, she realized that daddy wasn't with the Navy anymore, so she could, her opinion mattered. She could express her opinion. And she saw the swampland that was down there way back in 63 and said, oh no, 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 we're not bringing the girls here. <laughs> so we lived in Houston, Texas. So we really don't know any of you all. <laughs> Sorry, I can't answer your question. So they were off in the witness protection program. <laughs> Julie, is that, is that how you remember it? Or? Okay, yes, I mean, it was, um, mother loved her art, she loved her church, and she wanted to be closer to all of that in Houston. And um, we actually lived in an apartment, a high-rise apartment, uh, right across from the medical center in Houston. And um, I went to elementary school there, so I know what you know what it was like with people there. But like Laura said, we we didn't we weren't down in Clear Lake. Yeah, so. but of course, a lot of people were working for NASA throughout the area. I mean, there was a lot of that going on as well. So right. Rick, one time we were talking about Rick Armstrong. We're talking about. You know, who was it? It's like the old uh, Mr. Rogers, who are the people in your neighborhood? You know, the people that you meet when you're walking down the street. And you kind of start, I remember the first time you're going, well, over here in this corner and this and then this. So describe a little bit of that. Okay, uh, so Ed White was, lived next door. Uh, I know uh, for whatever reason, I believe Dad and, and Ed bought three lots and then slipped it in half uh, when, when we first got selected. Uh, down a couple streets over was was uh, was Borman and Stafford and Young and Isley. Fred Hayes lived six or houses up the other way. Bill Anders lived a little farther down. So yeah, Jack Bowsma was uh, sort of a street that was perpendicular to ours. So and there were plenty of others, right? Plenty of other people who uh, weren't astronauts but, but worked for NASA. So it was just we didn't really think anything of it. Kind of the normal, uh, 
that was just the normal. Was just, that was just were, normal stuff. The people didn't. were living yeah. next door. Yeah. So and then because there were so many, I don't. Nobody really made a big deal out of it. Yeah. Now we're not going to because we have such a large group here. This almost looks like those panels on election nights on CNN where they have the biggest panel ever. You know, <laughs> this actually goes one beyond the CNN panels here. Let's go down in that different time zone where the Aldrins are, and um, part of the left, I'll say. <laughs> a little bit. We'll go to the left, and uh, a little observation on that. And then the ground rules are: I mean, if you have a burning response, and if I haven't called you, you know, you've got microphones, or you have them nearby, you can wrestle them from the neighbor. You're, Reacquainting yourself with that neighbor or seeing for the first time to grab the microphone and jump in. But I like, I like to hear the Aldrin's, and I, and I see Susan Lovell is, is holding her microphone like she wants to uh, talk. talk. <laughs> Andy or Jan, just to... Um, well, in response to your question about what it was like to live in our neighborhood, I mean, we had the C's. Carrie was one of my friends, and the Shiraz. I used to run around with Susie Shiraz. She was like one of my best friends. Um, so, and we had pictures of us, the paparazzi, as they call them now, would come along and take pictures of us looking at squirrels and whatever else. She actually pasted some of those, or posted, I should say, on Facebook recently, which was kind of fun. Um, we actually had the Grissoms in our neighborhood, and you know, we used to just wander around. It was back in the day when you, you know, your dog could just go wherever you went without a leash, and that's how my mom and dad could find me, is wherever Christy was, we were. We didn't have any fences. Every <laughs> no, we, we didn't have any fences. There was no leash law, uh, and we, several astronauts. But everybody seemed to have some connection to NASA in Timber Cove, so everybody looked after everybody. And then at the end of the day, they would have some pretty big parties. I can recall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that actually, was called research. Actually, everybody that we went to school with, everybody—I mean, from elementary school all the way through call, high school. All of their dads and their moms had something to do with NASA in some way. So you yeah. couldn't swing a dead cat at our school without hitting an astronaut's kid. <laughs> <laughs> now, when, when Dad would come home, because you had know, Dr. Rendezvous and stuff like that, I mean, uh, did, did you, uh, what was that like? Because any of these guys bringing their work home with them, or was it, it all stayed back at NASA, what, you know, when they're, when they're home. Well, wait a minute, when my mom, oh, I mean, that's, that's, Jan, I wanted you to grab a microphone too, you're just, yeah, yeah, yeah your brother's holding out on you. Yeah. Can you repeat the radio, yeah, right. can you repeat the question? No, I was just saying, because, you know, the typical thing, people don't bring your work home with you, well, it's difficult to do when you're doing heroic, important things and trying to beat the Soviets, and I'm just thinking about how intriguing it must be with, with dad, Dr. Rendezvous, and Mr. MIT, you know, it's, it's, well, he would come. He would come home always, you know, dinner on the table at six kind of thing. But after dinner, he would go off into his study and smoke a pipe. And whatever he did in there, I don't know. But it was well, fun. he was just in there well, doing assume his it was study. A you know? pipe. Yeah. I just remember um, when I was trying to learn multiplication, um, how to multiply. I had a real problem with it when I was a kid, and. Dad whipped out the slide ruler and he started showing me, you know, how the slide ruler worked. Didn't help at all. <laughs> I was watching it on Mike. Michael Griffin has showed up now, so we have even more people to go. I object. That may not be true. We can applaud Mike Griffin. I like Mike Griffin. There he is, right there. All right, or not? Okay. <laughs> at what point? And let's go to the Russes on this first. At what point did you start to recognize that your life? was not the same as the rest of your kids, the kids your age. Although, like Andy said, you'd go to the school to swing a dead cat. How many dead cats were used by the astronauts' kids? <laughs> that, that's, that's classified. I, okay. <laughs> but, but when you realize that maybe this was a little different, did it take till you were like, I don't know, 38 years old? Or was it something earlier? Or did you feel kind of special, yeah, different? So I, uh, I have to laugh because, to put it in context, what they said is we all went to the same school. Um, and there was a very practical um, reason as a kid when your father was named to a flight, because of security and some other reasons, you'd stay home. And so I recall when my dad was selected for a flight, in, in, my, in my world, I was like, that is awesome, it's my turn to stay home. I mean, that's true, it was like, this is great, it's like a little vacation. Um, so I remember that was the kid. You know what I mean? The kid, it wasn't anything special that he was named on a flight. It's just that I was going to get a bit of a vacation. But then things start sinking in. I remember we were out in the backyard um, 
pitching the football around, and it was winter down in Houston, and I remember my dad going, I'm gonna go and get a sweatshirt, because last thing I need to do is get a cold before I go into quarantine. And you know, so there's something where your father's about to step into quarantine, but he's just another dad doing the football in the backyard. Rosemary? I think for me, I realized, because it was so natural in a way to grow up in this environment, you knew there was something special going on. But at that time, we were in the space race. Um, and it, it wasn't until I moved out of the neighborhood when my father uh, retired from NASA, we moved to Athens, Greece. And so it was over there that people would say, well, what does your father do? And I was just like, well, he was an astronaut and he went to the moon. And they would look at me like I was crazy. Um, and it's, it's when I came back and started outside of that environment and saying that my father was an astronaut, people would just kind of look at me like, mm-hmm. And then my, mo my mother um, grew up in Mississippi and she went to school with Elvis Presley from the sixth to the eighth grade. And when I would say my mother went to school with Elvis Presley and my daddy went to the moon, then really people would kind of turn me that's what if, they, if they didn't know, they'd say, Rosemary needs to go to the principal's office. Exactly. Now. A little discussion. And so, I don't know about the other children, and I think this is beautiful that we're all here together, but um, I kind of quit telling people that my father was an astronaut. Uh, and, and, and I found out unless you have somebody that can kind of introduce that aspect, um, it, it's not that, I, I mean, I was so proud of him, but I learned to not really talk about it too much. You know, I got to say this before we before we graduate. You all look great. Would you look over here? This is this is great. This is for social media. I learned this from Buzz. All right, here we go. This is great. Everybody, everybody, oh, I don't have Jan in there. Oh, this is beautiful for the holiday cards. Uh, no, it's not. It's just me doing this slowly. Okay, thank you. All right, go ahead, Laura. When okay, so I was in seventh grade when Daddy announced to the family that he was not going to be flying airplanes, jets for the Navy anymore. He was going to be an astronaut. I, astronaut is not in my dictionary. I looked it up, you know, Daddy's telling and I'm looking, there's no astronaut. What is an astronaut, Daddy? So uh, Life Magazine did a spread with the seven astronauts on the cover. And I'm walking to my bus stop in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where we lived at the time. And my dear friend, oh, I should preface this. Does anybody know Nadine Pratt? OK. So my best friend. <laughs> that went over well. My, my best friend, Nadine Pratt, unbeknownst to me, her father had applied for the astronaut program and had not been accepted. And so I'm going to the bus stop and this Life magazine comes out and announces that my father is an astronaut. And so, you know, I didn't, I mean, it, it wasn't a big deal in our house. Daddy, mother and daddy didn't make it into a big deal, Julie. Daddy, they kept us well grounded. And so I, I'm saying, hey Nadine, how are you doing? And she's like, oh, shut up. <laughs> uh, what? What? Shut up. And she wouldn't speak to me. And then the next day, I received an envelope from her. She handed me, it was sealed. When I got off the bus, that's what it was. And so when I get home, I open the letter and it's this awful, I'm sorry, this was like the sixth day that daddy is an astronaut. And there is this letter from my best friend at the time and telling me that I'm a, you know, it starts with a B and ends with an H. And I am stuck up and I am so stupid and just on and on about this and I'm, I devastate it. So I, my mother sat me down and taught me about the little green monster called Envy. I didn't have a clue what it was all about. And so that was my introduction to, you know, this publicity that we received. So I truly yeah. didn't tell people what my father did. That was all about Nadine, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and I still remember. Knows. 
a lot. This is where I feel like Dr. Phil. So, so now, it, it, now Nadine's been watching in the other room. We're gonna bring her in, and we're gonna see. Isn't that right, Charlie? Charlie Deer's back. That's right. That's right. That's good. That's good. Yep. So, so I, I, I was born into the space program. So, I mean, Dad being an astronaut to me was like being a doctor, being a policeman, being a fireman. I thought they were all cool jobs, you know, and that's just something he did. Um, but just only the people locally knew about that, not worldwide. And so uh, when I got a little bit older, I remember going to elementary school, and it was Friday, and it was show and tell day. I don't know if you all remember all the show and tells we used to do back in the day. And I had gone through the garage, and my dad had all these plaques in there. Um, and I found one that had a baseball player on it. And I'm like, wow, I'm going to go to show and tell, and I'm going to tell everybody my dad was a professional baseball player. <laughs> Not knowing all the teachers exactly know what he did. <laughs> Actually, it was just something we did locally. But uh, so I went there, and I was proud. Yeah, he played for the Houston Astros, <laughs> the MVP, you know, and all the kids were like, oh, wow. So it was much later in life before I realized, you know, what exactly what my dad did and, and the impact and the inspiration to many people in the world. So, um, and, and I got to learn that um, as I got to travel with my dad older on, older, and, and, and to see the you know, people listening to his talks and things like yeah. that. So, Andy? But you're right. We thought our dads were cool for other strange reasons. Right. My dad was cool because he could pole vault. Right, that was awesome. But you want to know who the coolest one was? Gordon Cooper, because he had a race boat, and that was cool. Uh, all right, Rick. Um, yeah, I really just completely agree with what Rosemary said. You know, when people would ask you what your dad did, sort of just didn't want to answer or come up with some other, a pilot, you know, right. something like that. And I, I have to say, though, I think I came by it honestly. I can remember being in, in a shoe store. Uh, with dad, and uh, so I think it was maybe in the Nassau Bay Village or somewhere around there. And buying shoes, and as we're checking out, the, the guy behind the desk is just, just kind of looking at him, you know, and he can't quite figure out who he is. And he, and he, he finally goes, Did anybody ever tell you you look like Neil Armstrong? <laughs> <laughs> and dad said, Occasionally. <laughs> and then we left. <laughs> So that was my role model for answering that question for years and years. Okay, now this is something, and, and Barbara, Jay, I mean, again, just j jump in here. I want to kind of spring from this, and you can all give us a quick, you know, we're, we're doing great on time. This is, this is fun. I like this. Yeah. First time that you, hey, some of these will, will continue at, at the bar later. Um, the first time you saw your dad at a launch, you know, whether it was, I mean, that, that first time that you went, why, what was going through your head? We could kind of assume, maybe, but... Or were you taking into secure rooms and... Um, well, the Apollo 11 was the first launch that I saw in person. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Wait yeah, a minute, it could, you it could, be, it could be you in person. You got to go to the launch, they wouldn't let us go. No, we... Mom would let us go. That was mom? <laughs> okay, I got issues now. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I'm sure, so everybody assumes everybody went to every launch. That wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, you, you might see it on TV. And so, like, like Laura, Laura and Julie, did you you watch uh, on television? Uh, Apollo 11 was my very first one. That was your and first one to, to it attend. It was uh, Susie Shara, Kent Slate, and I sitting on the top of this nice man. He said, "Oh, y'all sit up on top of the car." It's in an area where the astronaut families can yeah. go. And we're sitting there, and the countdown is getting ready to start. And it starts 10, obviously. And Daddy calls me over. He goes, Julie, come on over here. I want you to meet somebody. And so I walk over, and I'm hearing five, six. And Daddy introduced me to Charles Lindbergh and his son, John. And I hear, we have a liftoff. <laughs> 
And that was my first one that I had ever seen. While you're talking Lindbergh and the Sun. Just, a, just another everyday little thing. <laughs> if, if you don't mind, I'll jump in because that I have a very clear recollection of that. It, you know, back there, the astronaut viewing center was that crushed oyster shell yeah. parking lot. It wasn't much, but I remember it was the same deal. We're just kind of as kids running around, but I remember my mom saying, boys, boys, come over here. I want you to meet somebody. And there I met Charles Lindbergh, and I was just blown away. What, what, what Anybody who talked to Oral Wright anywhere? I just want to make sure. So Apollo. So I want to get it out there. What, one thing about the launches, uh, it was always a three-ring circus out outside the house. You had a thousand reporters out there. You had towers. You had satellites. You had everything going on out there. And they looked at every little thing that you did. So one day, if I was sick, they had to hide me and move me over to the Benwares house. Put me in the back seat, put a blanket over me, and take me to NASA. And NASA did everything for us. NASA was our doctor's offices, everything that we needed. We went to NASA. So, yeah, Dee is here, actually, Dee, Dee O'Hara. Everybody's always nice to Dee because she really has all the secrets and, and samples. That's right. Well, <laughs> and, you know, you, know, you ask, you know, you know uh, when, when did you know, you know, that something was really up? But well, one day my dad goes, you want to go to NASA with me? And, uh, and it was late in the evening. I said, sure. So we go over there, and he puts me inside the, the uh, uh, lunar lander, the land on the moon, the simulator. It says here, land on the moon. So they set it all up, I'm trying to land on the moon. After crashing three times, I said, I give this up. <laughs> Let them try it. But you know, you do things like that. You got to do little things. How, how, like how did he do? Oh, he did. He did. Right? Okay, just checking. <laughs> Crashing the lunar simulator was like a rite of passage. It was. It was. Like, one of the coolest things I've ever done. <laughs> I mean, so, so you got to do fun stuff. I mean, there, there was some fun stuff that we got to do. No trade North secrets, son. No, no. no. <laughs> That's why you did Bumps it later tonight. Night. Very late at night. Barbara, were you going to jump in there? You've been contemplating things, or? <laughs> I just thought I'd tell a funny story. Perfect. I was between I was between the ages of 12 and 17 during my dad's four flights, so I went through adolescence. Okay. So what I hated most was the media. As my brother said, there'd be towers. We went to all the launches, didn't we? Get all the all all the one. Which one did we not go to? Oh, that was seven. Okay. We went we went with all of them, but. Um, so the media, my, my good friend would come over, and the first time they were just, you know, massive. Cameras clicking, in your face. I'd try to come home from school, I'd hide, I'd go back the back way, and after three days, the cameras would be set up, Barbara level coming home from school. It was just an invasion of your privacy is what it was, because we weren't used to that. And, um, but I figured the next flight, um, Gemini 12, and then Apollo 8, and then they figured it out. I would act like I was Barbara Lovell's friend because I was doing so much changing going through adolescence. <laughs> and they'd all thought I was her friend until they finally figured out that I was Barbara Lovell. <laughs> but, you know, the, I was in fourth grade when my dad was in the program, and I remember going to, um, into Seabrook, and I remember my dad, it was, that NASA Road One was a two-lane shell road, Sorry. and and there was a there was a fence, a cyclone fence, and my dad said NASA's going to be built over there. There were cows over there. <laughs> we went to, to Seabrook Elementary, and no air conditioning. We came, you know, when you went wow. to school, you were dressed up in Virginia Beach, and we got into the school, and the kids were, you know, heaven forbid, they were in blue jeans and barefoot. And it was just a little bit of a, you know, a country place that we lived in. And so it was just a little bit out of a, a lot of where we had come from and what we had done. We had to go into Houston for a doctor's appointment. We had to go to La Porte to go to the grocery store. No. We lived in a place called Ellington Air Force Base. Yeah, yeah. We had one barracks and we had walls made out of sheets and four families. <laughs> That's yeah. where we lived. And we hit the officers. So this we is why the shepherds didn't move to that you're talking about. <laughs> okay, I, I got I to spring off of this. Is, you know, ladies, they just got to, because everything was, like Jay said, it's like NASA was, was everything. So those of you who, you know, when it was time to start get interested you know, in, in boys, whatever, you know, 
How did that work out? Did you have to run the, the, the two person, the crew assignments through Slayton? I mean, how did that work when you're meeting? At, or what, and what was, what would mom and dad do? What would dad say? I'm not sure if any, I'm just saying any of you who might have been, if you started dating, and what, what kind of um, feedback I, you'd get from I, dad. We couldn't date until we were 16. But I went away to boarding school in St. Louis, Missouri, uh -huh. when I was in eighth grade. And that was the year that Daddy went into space, May 5th, 1961. So in January of 1961, Mother and Daddy called me on the phone in the dorm. And that, you know, hardly ever did both of them be on the line at the same time, so I thought, uh, this might be an important thing I need to know. And that's when Daddy told me he was going to be the first American in space. But I couldn't tell anyone. <laughs> From January to May, I, an eighth grader girl, couldn't tell anyone. That was very cruel. And you're not very expressive either. Oh. It's hard to tell. I mean, I, really you tell me a secret, I will never tell anyone. I can keep a secret. So here I am in an English, it's May 5th, and I'm in an English test. And there's a knock on the door. It's a small prep school. And knock on the door, and the person comes in and looks at me and goes, it's time. It's time, your father's going to go up. And I thought that I was gonna hang out and watch this daddy go into space thing with my friends. No, I was directed to go to the headmaster's house. Dr. Bliss and Marinka Bliss. Did he know and, Nadine? Huh? <laughs> What'd you say? I said, did he know Nadine? I was just trying to pull the story together. Thank you. No, I, I love the Blisses, and they're very nice people, but he's still the headmaster of the school, and I'm only brand new eighth grader. So I walked down, and I just thought it would be Dr. and Mrs. Bliss, but no, it's the Dean of Girls and all the house moms, the Dean of Boys and all the house pops, the principal of the high school, the principal of the middle school, and then the man who's in charge of the whole school thing. All these big people that I didn't want to talk to. I have to sit on a little piano bench in front of a black and white TV with those little things, those rabbit ears, all by myself. No, but none of them came and sat next to me. Mother and Mommy and Julie and Alice are with Nana and Granddaddy in Virginia Beach, and here I am. <laughs> Let it out. Doctor Just whatever. Out. Doctor I, whatever. Flow. And so I watch the whole thing. I sit down and, I, and it's starting and I'm like, under my breath, I say, Daddy, please don't mess up. I don't want to talk to these people. Please do it good. Oh, and thank gosh, it was only 15, 16 minutes, right? <laughs> it wasn't 22 days or however many your father were gone. So then I had to shake hands with everybody and then go back to take my English test. And on the way back to the administration building, that's when I cried. That's when I got all of it out. I had to do it by myself. Yeah. But that's OK. He was alive and all was well. OK, and now I spring on that. And I think we probably all have assumptions when maybe the moment I, I want you to address would be like, and it's probably a lot of moments, maybe you were stoic and there was no moment. But the moment when you, you felt maybe what comes to mind as the most frightened you'd be as a kid. And it may be something that has nothing, I mean, yeah, people go, oh, okay, Apollo 13, that was probably, I mean, come on. But I is talk. that, you know, but there may be other moments, you know, I have one. growing one, up Apollo. One little one. First of all, I was only 11, so I wasn't allowed to date. But that's not the story. Um, when my dad was up on Apollo um, 13, this explosion happened at night. We had all gone to go see him at uh, the uh, NASA, um, and like usual or whatever. And we came home, and I guess by the, 
between, came to, between the time that we left there and got home is when the explosion happened. And my mother, I was not old enough for her to really, she didn't want me to know anything. I think our parents and our mothers were like matriarchs. They did not want, they kept us from all of the danger. Our dads just did what everybody else's dad did. There was no danger involved. And so she sent me to school the next day. Um, and I went to school and this boy came up to me and I don't remember who it was at this point, but he just looked at me and he said, I am, he looked at me and said, I am so sorry that your dad is gonna die. And I looked at him and I said, he is? I said, my dad's gonna die? And, and you know, the good news is I, I have my father still sitting here. You know? <laughs> so, um, anyway, that, that was probably the, I think that at that point is when I realized that my dad had a dangerous job. <laughs> and yeah, that was the last flight he did. Go by the lowest bidder, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I have kind of a similar story. I, I was uh, sent off to military school. So I was there from eighth grade until my senior year. And it was uh, uh, the fall of 13th flight, and I'm sitting in my, you know, in my uh, dorm room, sound asleep. Three o'clock in the morning, the headmaster walks in with, with like, what we call him the Wizard of Oz, because he looked like Oz, the Wizard of Oz. And uh, they, told me, they told me what's going on. And I said, okay, and went back to sleep. In my mind, NASA can't do no wrong. I was brought up by NASA. I was you know, uh, taught by NASA. I mean, NASA was, was our life. So they couldn't do no wrong. So it was the next day that things started to sink in. And the next thing I know, I had a couple of lieutenants. You know, this was a military school, and I was just a private, you know, really, you know, actually a new boy. And so I had these two bodyguards that would follow me everywhere I went because reporters started slamming the school, trying to get into the school, and trying to report on me. And you know, when she watched the launch, uh, what I watched when they dragged me over to the headmaster's house was the splashdown. You guys ever see the movie Apollo 13? <laughs> okay, I was a kid in military school, so they had, you, they had me in a classroom with a bunch of students, but actually I was at the headmaster's house in his study. Uh, with him and Father H was a, no, I can't remember his name. Father H, no, that was, uh, that was Webster. Uh, and I'm a priest, and, and we sat there watching, watching the splashdown at, in, at the headmaster's house. The next thing I know, somebody handed me an airline ticket, and I went home. So, <laughs> so that, that was my experience. Frightening moments, and you know, maybe it was launches, maybe it was those near disasters, maybe it was listening to the squawk box and hearing what the public wasn't hearing. I got to think, and Aldrin's and Armstrong's here, that that first, because I know how we all felt, and you know, I was a kid watching that in the Midwest with Swedish relatives who were there, and it's like, yeah, America. Yeah, it kind of, it's pretty cool stuff, the black and white TV and the whole thing. So, Rick, yeah, just jump in. Just, just frank, yeah, I, just I was actually never scared. Uh, just like during the flight scared. for two reasons. One is ignorance is bliss. And, and, the, two, and the second reason is I thought whatever happened, they'd fix it. You know, just, uh, so, and I think probably my mom had something to do with, you know, with that. The time I was the most scared was we, to, we went to a vacation in Acapulco a few times. There was a hotel there called the Lost Priestess Hotel. So the Lost Priestess Hotel was not a real, a traditional hotel. It was built on the side of the mountain. So everybody got their own little, uh, little casita, they called them. And you got a pink and white Jeep that you got to drive down uh, from your, uh, from top to down to the beach and they had like a tidal pool and we were there one time with Al Shepard and I rode in the Jeep with Al <laughs> Shepard <laughs> from the top down to the bottom and I did not think I was going to survive it. <laughs> was it you switch back roads, you, you know, mirrors yeah. on the trees so you can see around the corners. And uh, Rick, you probably never down rode down with my down dad, down. I don't think. <laughs> Well, you never got like Mr. Mr. Jeep, Action huh? Figure down here. He's always coming back from scuba diving or something. Yeah, or yeah. Or yeah. He do. drives a, a vehicle like a fighter pilot, pretty much. But I remember Las Cruces and all that. That was awesome. But I just want to say, um, just to re reiterate what Rick said, um, I did not have a sense of fear. Everybody asks me that, um, and I think it's it is because our mothers were so stoic. And um, my mother, uh, there's a very iconic photograph of her. Um, uh, and it was um, right when, was it splashdown? Or, or I think it's when they actually landed. 
or took off from the moon. I'm not sure which one. Yeah, so she's collapsing against the wall with a cigarette in her hand, but you can just see this look on her face that she just cannot believe how relieved she is. And when I saw that picture later, I, I was like, wow, she must have been terrified. It took me until I was an adult to realize how terrifying it must have been because we didn't feel like anything could go wrong. I would like to reiterate on that, that fear was not something that we felt in our house. Um, they were all dedicated to the program. They were talented. Uh, we had faith in them. Uh, the families had faith. But my mother's most frightening moment, she said, during the whole entire flight, was when Walter Cronkite did a live interview with us in front of NASA. And she put the fear of us as you will not mess up on live television. <laughs> and I was so scared I could barely say anything. But I think the words us kids learned to say the most was, it's great. <laughs> when your father, how does your father, I mean, how do you feel with your father up there on the moon? Great. So that was the word that I think us kids had, but that was her most fearful moment. Walter's a little intimidating too, you know. That's the way it is. <laughs> Other frightening moments? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, he just got an objection right. from us. I don't remember those words. So, there, is there coaching happening? <laughs> There's no coaching well, in baseball. Well, it's right. Okay. So, um, I did suffer from fear, but so picture it, right? I'm, I think, 11 years old, right? Ten. Ten, ten years old, okay. My dad's on the moon with 600 million people watching. Okay, you're a 10 year old, dad's on the moon, and he's bouncing around, right? <laughs> I know why he's bouncing around, too, because he's sort of studying different methods of locomotion on the moon, which is cool. I get it. But there's this TV cable, right? And I know he's going to trip over the cable, <laughs> fall on his back like a bug in front of 600 million people. <laughs> so can you imagine the embarrassment? The only saving grace was, was dead in the middle of summer, and I figured they'd forget about it when they got to school. So, so Rick, at that moment, because you know, people would ask your dad about you know, which, which, which foot, first foot, all this kind of thing. One time at our museum in San Diego, somebody asked him, and he, yeah, he'd been very yes, no, very calm, until that question was asked, and he says, he says why doesn't anyone ever ask about the landing? You know, that kind of thing. They just get very animated. I mean, was, that wasn't even a moment where you thought you're holding breath and Charlie's back in Michigan control going, you got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. I mean, or did you just figure, no, they didn't figure it out. He's not gonna land in a stupid spot, right, Buzz? I mean, you guys are, you're on it, but. Well, I think, as I remember, the, it wasn't super easy to tell what was going on from the, from the broadcast, right? So things would go by and you'd miss them. You didn't have the high, the, benefit of hindsight to completely understand everything. So, you know, when you heard program alarm and things like that, didn't really know what that meant. I'm not sure that the Now there'd be a channel telling you why what you're seeing is not what you're seeing. It's not really happening. There'd be yeah. a whole separate channel now. So, no, I, I think, you know, I just figured that it was there, it was going to happen and, and there wasn't, there was no other alternative it was going to make. So here's the thing, and this will be kind of a wrap-up question, and I want you all to, to get a piece of this, and then we'll be right on schedule, and, and that's good. But as you look at this now, I mean, this is so, isn't this cool? I mean, just having them all getting into this and hearing stories. When you now know, and you've known this for a long time as adults, but when you think about this, and when you look at time passing, and you look at the, you know, tomorrow, the, and this weekend, the 50th anniversary of Gemini 12, and we've already hit some big milestones. And, you know, it's, it's sometimes overwhelming. And then I was sitting with Rick at the ceremony today, when they're rattling off shuttle missions, it'd be like 1981, and it feels like it was yesterday, and you go, man, that, that's a long time ago now. The legacy question, and it, this is asked a lot, I'm sure, but, but you as adults, when you look back, and you recognize what, what each of your fathers did, and your mothers backing up, I mean, it's a, it is a family kind of thing. Obviously never easy, but what, what do you think of now when you think, okay, this is the legacy 
this is what, what I hold close to my heart, or I celebrate, or I praise, and just, you know, what, what is that? It's probably a lot of things, but just give us a little snapshot when you think about legacy and, you know, being, being the children of Apollo here. It's no small thing. Just jump right in and we'll just go. I want everybody, I want everybody to address it even it's, if it's... You know. It's an easy answer for me. It's, it's all the people that come up to me and, and tell me they were inspired to be whatever they have become because of the program, because, because of what those guys did. They went on to be something great. I mean, and you just sort of think about that and it's sort of extrapolated out around the world about how much, how different would it have been if they weren't inspired that way? I don't know if I'm making sense, but they, they you just, the, a lot of these people have gone on to do great things themselves. And, and so I think that's the biggest impact that, that I can think of from the program is the, the inspirational value to the, that's the world. Julie and, and I have one. Okay, you can. Every time I pick up my cell phone, I think of my daddy. All of the spin-offs that we have gotten from NASA to help us, the world, is amazing. And all the thousands of people that were employed at NASA. That, I mean, it was a wonderful era for the United States. That's daddy. All right, Julie, and then we'll go Alan Rosemary here. Okay, so let's go. Uh, yeah, um, the legacy, it's, it's the people that were involved at that time. To me, as little as I was, it, it was such a patriotic time. And um, the people that worked for NASA, it, I mean, Daddy took time to go and speak with the people that were working for him to be able to have a successful flight. And the legacy that Daddy and all the astronauts, the original seven and the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, is that the legacy that we really want to keep going is that we want to be in the forefront America in space and technology. And I feel really that that's, you know, that's the legacy that I want to carry on. That includes students, that includes everybody. Great. Uh, Rosemary, then we'll go over to Alan, and then we'll go, then we'll go to the Auburn corner, and, and we'll, we'll wrap up with a level. And there's plenty of them. Okay. I, I, I agree that the legacy is inspiration, education, um, for people to be inspired by the Apollo program. It united the world when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped foot on the moon. It, it was a moment that everyone can come back and say, I know exactly where I was. And um, I hope that, my father used to give these speeches where he talked about, he was a very proud American, and he would say, when you look up at that moon tonight, there are six American pla flags planted on that moon, and no other country can boast that. And so, now it's turned uh, international, as it should be, uh, in cooperation. But he was very proud of the fact that America had six flags. And when you look up at that supermoon tonight, remember that. And the legacy is just to have those, those people that inspire us to do better, to push a little bit harder, and uh, to, to, be all the, to be the best that you can be, and to take whatever talent it is that you have and, and leave it for the next generation. He was always big on kind of, you know, taking it to the next level so that the children can take it to the next level and just be a better place for it. All right, Alan? Yeah, that, my dad was a patriot, so I, what Rosemary touched on is like dead on. To him, it was a race. We were gonna beat the Russians to the moon, and so love a country is a legacy that he passed on to us. But to me, the one legacy that I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of blown away. Here's my, my father in his late 30s, and he did something. He was a smoke jumper. And so he took a bunch of uh, seeds to the moon. And I'm always impressed that he had the foresight to take seeds to the moon that moon trees now are all over the world. Um, so it, it creates like a, uh, a lasting legacy in a very unique way that I know when I was his age, I wouldn't have had that kind of foresight. 
but the moon trees, I think, is just a wonderful legacy that I always, <clears throat> when I see those trees, I always think of Daddy. That's great. Let's go down to the Aldrins. And then sure. So the legacy is the people. I mean, it's the engineers, the entrepreneurs today that make our space program great. But what matters to me, and I know what matters to my dad, is not the last mission. It's the next mission. And, and it's all about being on Mars permanently. And you know, if you think about it, in a thousand years, they're going to be history books. They're going to have one line about going to the moon. There'll be an entire chapter written about permanence on Mars and humanity settling on another planet. And so for me, I don't know, for that guy, that's kind of what gets us excited. And it all started with Apollo. Jan? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Proud, honored. We'll have copies of Jan's remark <laughs> available as, as you leave tonight. All right. And and again, no pressure, but but Dad, well, he's got his arms kind of this, you know, kind of like like don't screw up, you know. So we'll wrap up with levels here. All right. So whoever, I don't know how I'll you start. want to build. I'll start with the youngest because uh, I grew up and I, I I didn't live it so much, but I learned just by hearing all the stories. The space program back in the 60s and 70s was a flashpoint in history. I mean, it was, and it was the true definition, I think, of the American dream. You dream it, and we did it. And I think during that time, we had a lot of things going on in the world. We had wars going on, but it brought the world together um, and, and inspired a lot of people. And even today, I, I've been letting people know on Facebook that I'm celebrating my dad's uh, 50th anniversary, uh, and it's just amazing the response I get from so many people. And it's like right after this election when everyone's got hate going on, and, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, that was just a wonderful period in time, and it was great, and it was wonderful. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wh why aren't we, let's get going again. That's what we need to be doing is we need to get right back in the saddle and, and get this thing going again and, 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 and inspire uh, the generation today. So. Well done. All right. Barbara, Jay, Susan, so young. I'm Susan. just going to add just one, one uh, word to uh, the people that were so inspiring, that have inspired so many young people, uh, just to the, to the people that were in the program, that ran the program. But the part of that I wanted to bring is teamwork. Um, and I bring this because of Apollo 13. If these if the people on the ground and the people around the world and, and the, the three guys up in the capsule did not come together and work together as a team and motivate each other, Yay! they would not be back today. So, so I just wanted to add that to what everybody else had to say, just the word teamwork. The thing I want to add um, is what you all are doing. Uh, the space park that we went through last night uh, with all the history that's there, you see that it inspires kids from all over the world that go there, and the whole trick is inspiring. I, I want to see the Orion Project back on the board. I, I want to see it go up. I want to see it go, to go back to the moon. I want to see it to go to Mars before I ever pick the bucket. I want to see that. So you know, it's, it's, it's that's the legacy that you guys are planning, and that's what you're you're making for all of us. And that's all I wanted to add. Right. Barbara. Else? Ditto. No, but I, I, I have grandsons, and I, the oldest is four, and in his little preschool, they have a little program called STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. It's starting in the preschools, and we've got a generation of kids coming up that's going to be following his great-grandfather's steps and all the other men and women who've made it possible, so we have a future. Ladies and gentlemen, the children of Apollo. I don't know about you, but I, it, it's really special to have been here tonight. And, and, you know, I was a kid growing up in, in the Midwest watching all this happen. And the idea that one day to know so many of, of your dads and to get to know many of you as friends, and it's it just, it, it's such an honor. It's something we should never take for granted in terms of what all this means. That's why I love Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. That's why I love the fact that people, I love seeing these guys come down that ramp today. Did you? <laughs> Lovell comes down there like he's 28. He's, all right, I'm gonna, Stafford, they're all plowing out there on an incline and a curve. And I mean, that's,
God bless them. God bless America. And thank you. Enjoy the rest of the evening. We'll see you tomorrow.